we actually didn't realize just how long ago it was until we calculated it earlier and then we decided not to think about those numbers anymore. Playing some 10Ks in France, and maybe some in England too. Maybe in England too, a long time ago. But since then, and I haven't seen her, she's done some really phenomenal stuff. She's played college tennis at the University of Florida and got some degrees I don't even know how to pronounce. Kinesi Master <laughs> kinesiology and sports psychology and motor behavior from UT. So um, I probably need to learn a lot from what she's got to say because I'm mentally totally crazy on the tennis court. So without further ado, here's Claire Bartlett. Thank you, Claire. <clears throat> <Yeah. laughs> All right, thanks, y'all. How's everybody doing today? Really? Energy? All right. Well, like Margo said, my name is Claire. Um, I am. I teach part-time. I'm a tennis professional, and then um, the other part-time job I have is my new business, Empower Sport and Performance Enhancement. And I'm a sports psychology consultant. Um, I have my master's in sports psychology, and I basically work with athletes um, and well, just tennis players especially, but a lot of other athletes just individually one-on-one. -on -one, and then I go around and do middle skills workshops with groups and teams. Um, and in, 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 um, but today, I'm here to talk to you about, well, just really give you a brief introduction on sports psychology, and then just to give you some mental skills um, that you can take today and um, implement into your coaching and share with your players. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a story, um, and this is just really a testament um, to how powerful your thoughts are and how important that is in influencing your behaviors. So um, there was this man named Captain Sands in the Vietnam War, and he got captured, and he was then taken to become a prisoner of war. Um, some people may have heard the story, but if not, that's cool. Um, so anyway, so he was taken to be a prisoner of war, and then he um, got you know this little small cell where he basically couldn't move at all, and he, he basically had to lay down. He had no physical activity. He had limited resources to food and didn't have any physical contact with anyone. Um, so as you can imagine, these are horrible conditions and situations and a lot of us would easily think, you know, really negative thoughts like how in the world am I going to make it out of here? Um, how long am I even going to last? Um, and I'm sure he went through some of those thoughts, but um, the really cool thing about Captain Sands was, was he kind of was like, okay, I'm not going to just accept this situation, I'm going to make this better. Um, so while I'm here for all these hours in the dark in solitary confinement, I'm going to um, think of a golf course, and I'm going to recreate this golf course in my mind, and um, that's where I'm going to go every day. So that's exactly what he did. He recreated this golf course, he knew every detail, he knew how many yards were in each hole, he knew where every sand trap was, everything he knew. And then after he would recreate that golf course, he then would go back and play it himself. So he was like, well, it's my golf course, so I'm going to play it perfectly. So he hit, like, hole-in-ones, and he, you know, sometimes he hit, like, you know, birdies or pars and just did whatever he wanted, but he executed all the things that he wanted to do. Um, so long story short, he went through seven years of doing that because that's how long he was in um, that solitary confinement, and he eventually was released. Um, and so he came back home, and he played, well, I didn't mention, sorry, he was a casual golfer before he entered the war, so like he maybe shot 100, like on a good day, um, but then he came back home, and he's like, all right, I'm going to go play the golf course where I played, and um, so that particular day that he came home, he ended up shooting a 74. Okay, so he went from 100 <laughs> to 74 in like seven years, no physical activity, like, and then all the other things he had to deal with, like, it's kind of hard to believe story, right? Um, no physical practice or anything. But that was just, it just goes to show how powerful imagery is. And if you can really see things in your mind and believe those, then the more likely, the more likely you will be able to, like, succeed and actually execute those. So, um, it was just a, just a story to start off. So. Okay, so what is sports psychology? So we all have heard of it, or I'm pretty sure we've all heard of it, um, and there's an academic definition up there, and it's long and complicated, so y'all can read it for yourself, but the way I like to think about sports psychology is just the study and the application of mental skills that you can use in competitive situations or pressure situations um, to perform your best. So. 
All right, so sports psychology has its roots in a lot of different schools of thought. So there is positive psychology, which is kind of self-explanatory, but being optimistic, being, thinking positive thoughts. Educational psychology, person-centered psych. So um, a lot of, especially at the high levels, like some coaches, you know, depending on how extreme they are, might think, you know, these players are robots and they just need to do this, this, and this. And but we have to remember, hey, there's always a person first and the athlete second. Um, so that's what kind of person-centered psychology is. Um, humanistic, holistic. So um, a lot of breathing techniques and yoga and tai chi, all of that, and, and relaxation and meditation, all of that kind of runs into um, the techniques we use in sports psychology. The thrive or survive mindset, so anybody, you know, you can get through anything if you put your mind to it, but it's like, how do you get through that? You know, do you just like come out and like, you're like, okay, I'm done, or do you come out on top and like with a positive attitude and you've learned something? Um, and, oh, sorry, yeah, one more. <laughs> and then strength face. Um, so, if you were to go to a clinical psychologist, um, they might, depending on their theories and how their orientation, they might like break down all of your issues basically and then build you back up. But in sports psychology, we like to look at people's strengths and what they're good at and build those up first and then they're even more confident about themselves so then they can reach down maybe to things that they want to improve on and not feel so bad about it, okay, because they have the other strengths. All right, so why use sports psychology? Um, there, are, there are lots of studies and there's lots of research done on this, but this one I thought um, just was most relevant and what was most helpful. 90% of Olympic athletes have surveyed that they've used some sort of mental preparation in their training sessions um, before, before they go into the Olympics. And, um, and not everybody wants to be an Olympic athlete. Like some people just want to be a high school athlete. Um, but at whatever level you want to get to if you want to improve um, there's research and and you know there's there's facts that saying that practicing these mental skills is going to help you get better and it's going to help improve your performance all right so i keep saying mental skills like what are mental skills um, there's a ton of them up there so i just put them and there's even more but i'm um, just a few relaxation um, focusing strategies there's Communication, um, motivation is a skill. Some people think like, oh no, motivation, like you're either motivated or you're not. Well, in sports psychology, we believe, no, you can actually work on motivation. You know, if you're, there's a, there's a reason that you're not motivated and we can help build that motivation. So, um, and the rest are on the next slide. Yes. Energizing techniques, will you touch on that a little bit? Energizing techniques, yeah. So, um, like, like what are they? Yeah, like, are, yeah. A, yeah, so like, like if if people have trouble, like let's say there's somebody that's really nervous before a match and they kind of shut down, you know, like there are ways, um, breathing techniques like muscle strengthening and relaxation things that you can run them through to help them like relax and like get more energy. So I mean I'd have to go into a lot more things, but, but that's kind of what that is. And like just like I was saying, like there's a thing, um, a relaxation process that I take people through and I'll go through every muscle group in their body um, and like to tense and relax and then like have them do a little bit of a dynamic warm-up after um, and then mix that in with just some like positive affirmations stuff like that so that's kind of what the energizing techniques are yeah. yeah and if anybody has any questions on going through this please just tell me talk about it. okay so how will sports psychology help um, so it'll obviously like if you have these you're going to be setting goals in sports psychology, so if you have goals, it's going to improve your focus, right? And um, and if you have your goals, then you're also like, you know, some practices, like if you have a player that hasn't done sports psychology and they have some emotional issues, right, maybe their practices will be like really up, really down, and just like, you know, they could be really mad one day and then like, then like fine and happy the next day. Um, but if you have sports psychology and you have your goals set and everything, you're practicing mental skills to get better, they might have more consistent practices to where like they're not getting super mad, but then like, you know, they're they're trying to like I I said that wrong, but you know, they're they're trying to um, just improve and focus and stay positive. So um, and then this will also build your confidence. The more you go through these things, the more you um, build your mental skills, you know, you hope to see benefits and that's gonna that turns into wins and then you get confidence. Um, and
can just increase positive feelings. When to use sports psychology? Um, I tell people you can actually use it all the time um, because even though we talk about it in the realm of sport, you can use it when you're at home talking with whoever you live with. You can use it at school. You can basically bring it anywhere. But in regards to sport and tennis, you can use it um, during, before, or sorry, before, during, and after a match um, or a practice session. You can use it when you're talking with a teammate or a coach. Um, you can also use it when you're in physical therapy, like if you're rehabbing from an injury, or if you're just you have an injury and you can't do anything, you can use it. Um, and you can use it when you're transitioning out of sport. So if you have somebody that's 16 and they're just like, I've played tennis for a lot of my life, but maybe it's just not the thing for me, then like there are ways that you can talk to your player about how to transition out, because that's been a big part of their life for those you know 10 or so years, how many ever years they've been playing. Um, and the same if it's an injury, maybe a career-ending injury, and right after college, you know, they've, they've spent all this time in tennis, but now, like, what are they going to do? Like, maybe they didn't focus as much on school, so then there, there are ways you can help them transition out. So. Did you, oh, you didn't oh, no, sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, hear me. So how often can you use sports psychology, and how long will it take to see results? Um, so gen generally when I'm working with people one-on-one, -on -one, I tell them, like, three to five times a week, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, like if they come and see me for an hour consultation, that would obviously be one time, but like doing it on your own is really important, like for you to retain things and learn and actually practice executing them. Um, so three to five times a week, 15, 30 minutes. Um, and then you want to, well it takes about like, probably, it, it depends on the person, it might take a month for somebody to learn a numinal skill, you know, if they're already like strong at it and they just get better, then that might just take a month. But it might take people three to six months, you know, if if they have anxiety issues and we're working on relaxation and they've never done that before, it can make them really uncomfortable. So we can spend a whole month just on like familiarizing them with like the whole process of going through and like, I mean, just to give you an example, a, re a relaxation session, you know, if I'm working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, I'm going to talk with them and I'm going to run them through that session and I'm going to tell them to close their eyes. And some people are really uncomfortable closing their eyes with a person they don't know very well and, like, they don't know what I'm going to say. So um, that's where learning a mental skill can, can vary. So what can um, you do for your players as coaches? Um, so first, and this is where this handout comes into play, assessing your own coaching orientation. Um, so whether you're receptive or kind of closed-minded to mental skills, um, I obviously believe it's important, and um, I get a feeling that you all think it's important too. But there are some people who are who don't think it's that important, and doesn't don't think that it has that big of a part in um, athletics. So um, just challenging your orientation, like asking yourself you know, how has this been effective in my life and how, um, you know, how can I, you know, uh, use it to better my students, like, asking yourselves those questions and just making sure you have your philosophy down as a coach, you know, like, if you, it's just like in, you know, with tennis, like, you know what you think about the forehand and you know that, like, the racket face needs to be down and they need to, they don't, need to have a continental grip, I mean, in my opinion, you know, like, that's something that's a firm belief that you know, like, in tennis, so it's kind of the same thing with your coaching, um, with your being receptive to mental skills, you, you want to know, like, why you think mental skills in sports psychology is important, um, so there's that, and then, um, and then understanding your role as a coach, um, in the mental skills provider, so in a perfect world, like, we would be able to be both, like they're somebody's full-time coach and somebody's full-time mental skills provider and like help them the whole time, but I know a lot of you all are really busy and maybe working like seven, eight hours on court, so it's not ideal to sit down with somebody for a whole hour talking about mental skills, you know? Um, but there are ways and that I'm gonna tell you, the suggestions I'm gonna show you, there are ways to implement those into your practice sessions. Um, so just understanding that like you you don't the player doesn't need to expect you to be like their end all be all right but you can still like do the best you can with the mental skills and the time that you have um, and help them there so.
I mean, understanding your player's needs, and this is this is on that sheet as well, um, and I won't take all the time to explain this because it takes a long time, we can have a whole lecture on this, but um, understanding those players' needs, so just asking them questions and um, asking, you know, sometimes we get caught in, um, like Margo was saying earlier, we get caught in of like having our lesson plans and having what we're going to do, um, but maybe like take a step back and be like, hey, what do you want to do today, and like just ask them you know, ask them questions, and if they're not responding to the questions you're asking them, ask them different questions. You know, ask them open-ended questions. Um, and people will tell you a lot about, like, if you ask them open, open questions and just let, let them talk. So, um, but that's, that's just another way of how to get um, your players to need. So. All right, so the first step to self-improvement is self-awareness. Um, and I put that up here because self-awareness is a mental skill. Um, we're going to cover today. And um, so what I'm going to talk about is we're going to go through recreating your best performance, journaling, practice sessions, and matches, and setting goals. Okay? Um, so you can go from this side. Okay. So I'm going to take you all through this exercise just so you know like what it's like and how you're thinking and everything. And then we're going we're gonna to share it um, after we're done writing it down. Um, but, but you can write it down however you want to. You can write it in a paragraph, or you can do it like in a web, it, just however your brain works. Like, you go ahead and do that. Um, so, so this best performance. So I want you all to think, if you can grab a piece of paper or something you can write, it, <coughs> um, I want you all to think of a time where you played um, a match, and it was your best match ever, okay? And I want you to remember like every single detail about it. So I want you to remember where you were, who you played against, how the weather was, um, you know, what the score was in that match. I want you to try to remember how the ball felt on your strings. Um, just any small detail about that experience. If you can just write that down or think about it for a minute or two, and then we're going to all um, come together here and talk about it. One more minute. So finish up with your, in your last bits. Um, does anybody want to volunteer and share their experience? Yeah, February 2008, Austin P. State University. First court on the left, playing Brett Shaw. Executed my plan perfectly. Inside out forehands all day long on big points. Inside in. Ball felt great, I felt great. 
literally the plan went exactly how it should have, and I lost to that guy a season earlier in a tough match. I beat him in straight sets. I think I got nervous, but I mean, I knew my plan and executed it. So were you, you were still, I assume you're still able to focus like through being nervous. Yeah, I was nervous because the second set was a lot tighter, but uh, I just knew that you know I was opening up the court for the shot I wanted. So on the big points, I, I played better than he did, and um, I had a net a net ball that went my way, but it was it was still a good day. Anybody else? I don't have such a detailed uh, experience. All right. I guess I, I think that a lot of the factors that I remember from the few matches that I felt great. Um, or a lot of it is the outside environments and what I was doing inside, with my, what I was telling myself. Um, like I remember being windy, I remember people yelling at me, or and I remember just being, you know, whatever I was telling myself. But I don't, I can't, I don't know, it's kind of like I, I keep on like going back to the images, I, I remember that it, it's kind of like I can see it, but I can't go back and be like, what was my plan? Like you can't go back and be like it was a specific match, like it was. No, no, a, I remember the specific remember matches. Match? I just don't okay. like them is saying, you know, like yeah. he remembers, like Feather remembers after he finishes every match. He remembers yeah. certain points in certain games, but anyway. Well, that that's that's funny because a lot of players actually say that, and that's what we call flow, and it's where you you're playing so well and things are going mm -hmm. so well, you don't even think, like you don't yeah. even know what you're doing really. And, and that's really what we're all working for, and that's why we have sports psych, is to get to that level of peak per performance. Mm -hmm. um, because when, when it's becoming you know, so automatic, I mean, that's when you're most relaxed, and that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what everybody's, all these um, scientists and everybody have studied, you know, they've studied that like, the less brain activity when you're in those high pressure situations, the better. One more person? I struggled to think of a particular match that felt really good, actually. I spent most of the time trying to remember one. And I sort of fell on two. One, I actually only remember the tournament. I don't remember the matches in that tournament. But I just remember I was in such a good mood, without naming too many names. One of the coaches at school had just got fired. And I was in a really good mood because I didn't like him. <laughs> And I won the whole flipping tournament on the back of it. <laughs> I was taking everything on the rise. I don't remember the. I remember where I was over in Memphis. I remember vaguely where I was. I remember vaguely. I know my ankle was all taped up because I just destroyed half the ligaments in it a couple of weeks earlier. And I was on fire. And I just remember being really happy. And it's funny. And then the only other match I could remember where I felt that good is the exact same match where my flipping tendon exploded. But I was feeling so good and I had this unbelievable inner confidence about me. I was firing down the best serves ever this time last year. I just remember feeling so happy and so confident. That's the only thing I remember. Well, it's funny because then sometimes, like, when you have something dramatic like that happen, like an injury, you know, sometimes you have to adjust things in your game, right? Like, maybe you won't be able to hit 50 balls a point. Maybe you're going to have to go for more. And then sometimes... That'll work on a given day, and then yeah, you're on cloud nine, like when when that actually works. So yeah. I kind of have a twisted, I have a twisted example. Mine was <laughs> mine was playing a pro that basically grabbed me as a junior and wanted me to work out with him, and I had no clue why. And so he basically shaped my game, developed my game, and I was playing him on a clay court during the fall. Everything seemed super slow, the court seemed large, obviously no net. So I played my game, executed better than I ever had. Everything just felt slow motion. Felt like it could do nothing wrong. But it was a totally wrong experience because after playing the match, the reaction from him that I got, he's a total competitor, it brought me back down and said to him, patting me on the back and saying, that's what I wanted you to do. He took everything away from me. And so, in and, and doing so, it kind of, it was like, you know, just a slap on the back instead of, you know, brought me up and just tore yeah. everything away. Yeah. And on top of that, maybe late for late night, so.
<laughs> but it was the best, That's it was probably the best win. Yeah. You know, just yeah. the experience on the court. Um, you know, going back, I don't know if you know, everyone else probably played different sports, but I played basketball and you always have those moments where the goal feels humongous and everything coming off your hand just yeah. seems like you can't miss. And it was just one of those matches. Yeah. So well, and the, the good thing about that, though, is, okay, like, you know your best performance, and you also know, like, maybe one of the worst, like, not so good. Now it feels to really feel down. So then, you know, like, like you can figure out a happy medium there, you know. So it's good to have both references. I do, I do that sometimes with people. I, I tell them first to say, like, maybe one of the, list down one of the performances, like, that you didn't do as well. And, and what happened and what we're thinking about and how they make you feel and everything. And then we end with the positive. Um, so then they have both of those as markers. Um, so, and that's another thing y'all can do. Um, but I do like to start with the positive, <laughs> at least today. So, okay, all right. Okay, um, so the next one is journaling practices and matches. Um, I know we all know about this. This is pretty common sense, right? Like it's. I mean, if you want to get better, you have to know, like, where to start. So, um, so this is journaling, but make sure you include all of this information. Um, if anybody else can think of anything else, like, let me know. But these are the big things that I like to focus on um, with my students. And I like to have them recorded down um, because then it's, it's easier to see over like a week's time and a month's time and all that other progress, like not only physically but mentally. Um, and it's a lot. It makes it a lot easier um, to see what we need to work on um, and what you know what they're good at. Um, so, so yeah. Um, do y'all have any questions about that? Um, and and y'all can y'all can write these down or we can send a PowerPoint. But there's that. So. <laughs> all right. So goal setting. Um, has anybody heard of SMART goals? Has anybody heard of SMART goals? Okay, so it's specific, measurable, attainable. Um, I'm going blank. Realistic. Realistic and time related. Okay, so when you're setting goals, you want to keep the um, SMART goal in your mind there. Um, and, and then you want to set long-term and short-term goals. Um, and then you want to set them for practice and competition. Um, and just, just making sure you include all this so, so everybody, um, so your kids, you know, have this to look at. Writing them down is so important. I, um, I don't know, where, has anybody else had, like, a creative space to write your goals down, like, to put your goals? Where, where do people put them? Or do y'all write goals? Do we write goals in here? <laughs> okay. Near my computer screen. Near your computer screen? Okay, so somewhere you're going to see it. Right. I've had people put it on the neck of their tennis racket. It's a really interesting place. Um, and then I've had people put them in the cars, which I'm not sure. That might be a little dangerous, <laughs> as long as you keep your eyes on the road, I guess. Um, I personally put some of my goals. I had some fitness and nutrition goals I wanted to accomplish, so I put those um, in my cupboard um, for like my food and stuff. So I saw it every time I went to... It was pretty intense, but like it helped me remember remember things. Um, so you can get creative with that. Um, yeah. I used to play with a girl who would run them on her shoes. Oh, really? oh yeah, that's really good. So you'd look down the story yeah. and yeah, yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> okay, and then um, just obviously once you set those goals or once um, your players set those goals, make sure to monitor them and make sure they're consistent with like their commitment level. You know, so it's one thing if. <coughs> Like little Johnny says, hey, you know, I want to um, win Wimbledon, but they practice once a week, you know, and, and they, they're only intending to practice once a week. So just make, that's an extreme example, but make sure um, the goals are consistent um, with their commitment and what, what they want to do. So. All right, and then I have some resources here listed. This USTA Middle Skills and Girls Handbook is like the Bible for, for all these middle skills. It has on-court and off-court drills that you can do, because um, I've only touched on a few, and they were pretty pretty obvious ones, but these are really creative, and um, it would be a great resource. I have it here with me today, so if y'all want to take it and look at it, um, there, there are a lot of good drills in there. And then In Pursuit of Excellence, has anybody read In Pursuit of Excellence? 
Okay, it's it's a good one. Um, it's Terry Orlick, and he's um, one of the just main guys in sports psychology. Um, and then Foundations of Sport and Exercise. That's just a big sport psychology textbook, but it really breaks a lot of things down, just about the profession and about mental skills training and um, incorporating that into your as a coach and as a consultant and everything else is really good. All right, and then um, if you want to connect with me, I have a Facebook page. <laughs> it's just funny, Margo was saying about the branding. I just laugh every time I see this page because it's so long, you know? Like, it's such a mouthful, and like to write the email address, but it is what it is right now. I will change it, but um, but yeah, and I have a website. It's, it's in the works right now. Um, but yeah, and that's my email, so if y'all have any questions about anything, feel free to contact me. The next slide is, go ahead, is that the next one? Yeah, it's my sources, so. Um, yeah, so, so that's it, but um, I was just planning on having a little Q&A um, at the end. So if y'all have anything about what I talked about today or like what I do when I'm consulting or anything like that, um, or if you have an, a player with an issue right now, um, just shout it out. <laughs> yes? Um. I have a player in the quarterfinals or semifinals of the U.S. Open, and I need to prepare that player to have 13 people on the court, cameras on the sidelines, 20,000 people in the stands, and I'm on a practice court one-on-one -on -one, trying to do preparation with that player. What kind of experience should I create for them on a practice court that will simulate the feelings they're going to have on the, on the main court? Well, that's a great one. Obviously, you can't exact, you know, get 40,000 people <laughs> to come and scream at you. Um, but I think making it, like, the most distraction-filled practice as possible. So if you, like, blare some music, you might, you know, get some another pro to come talk to you randomly and maybe, like, maybe hit random balls. I mean, just make it, like, crazy, like, practice is what I would say. Since you, I mean, and you can even ask the kids' parents to come, you know, like, because that's a little, that's, some kids struggle with, you know, their parents on their side, and they get distracted because they keep looking over, you know, you can ask the parents to come to a session, um, and, and work with it that way, um, but really trying to put as many distractions as you can. Do you, do you think that makes sense? Like, do, do you think that would work in real life? Like, can you picture it with this? I can imagine player. the distractions, but I'm also talking about the whole experience, the nervousness, the psychology, the whole grandeur of that moment is very different than what we what exists in a regular practice. So right. it's not just what might happen from the outside people, but what's going on internally for them. Right. Kind of tap into that. Well, I mean, I think that's something, if you've gotten to the U.S. Open, you've obviously trained for a long time and you've had that goal, so that's something that you need to do way ahead of time and prepare and you, you would use like relaxation techniques. Imagery is a huge one like with the story I started off with. If you can have your player recreate that experience and he knows or he or she knows what the US Open looks like, they've seen it on TV, if you can pick a court and just imagine yourself on there and then um, you know have someone or you can yourself take them through an imagery, sorry, an imagery session where they can really feel everything about that place. I think that's where, in, in doing that over and over, three to five times a week, 30, 30 minutes, 20 minutes even, um, but doing that over and over, I think that'll help the most internally, and then maybe externally, like what I was saying in y'all's lessons. Um, thanks for clarifying that. I didn't, I didn't quite understand, but yeah. yeah. Does that does that help? Okay. Real quick, I want your take on Djokovic's performance at this year's U.S. Open Finals, where it seemed that everybody but his box and one guy off to the left was cheering against him. Right. And also, to counter that, what about Nadal? Because he keeps talking about kind of being a little bit weaker mentally this season, and, and he's having a good fall now, but yeah. what are your takes on those two players? Um, this, is a, this is a rough one because I actually don't watch a ton of Protons, but I did watch that match, um, and I think, I mean, it's hard to be able to prepare for that, right? Like, Djokovic, like, you don't want to think going into match that no one's going to cheer for you, but I think, I mean, the times I've watched, it's it's been all, like, in Grand Slam finals or semifinals, and I know Djokovic, 
Djokovic isn't the favorite, you know, and so I think he has to kind of get that a little bit, you know, and so maybe he has prepared for, I mean, right. like, I mean, you do you think he's think using he sees that as that? fuel? You think he's using it as fuel, like a chip on his shoulder, like okay, no one cheer, no one's cheering for me. Let me give them something to cheer about, or maybe just to stick it to the fans with Federer. I don't know, because he he was he was amazing. That's the the one thing that stood out in that match for me was just his mental strength to block everything out and to focus on his his goals. Yeah, well, I mean, I I can definitely see something like that driving him because it's it's a huge negative. It's a huge disadvantage going into a match like that. Um, so if he were to anticipate that at all, I would see, and what I know about him, he's very, he's very um, internal and he does take a lot of time to really be self-aware and he reads a lot about um, mental skills and I know he practices so like, I mean I can definitely see him taking that and running with it as something that's going to be in his toolbox, you know, to, to motivate him. So. Nadal, I haven't seen play as much because he's been hurt a lot and then he hasn't been, um, well, I guess he has been playing a little bit more this fall, but, but um, I mean, I'm sure with, I could go on and on about Nadal. I love Nadal, but I don't know how much the injuries are really injuries. Um, I mean, I like to think that they're injuries. I don't know what I think about that. Is it a um, injury? <laughs> it could be, but... Um, Obviously, if you're not out on the court a lot, you're going to lose confidence. And I think that's what he's feeling right now. I mean, he's the top four, like, you know, getting into that group is just ridiculous. And, and then taking a few months out and then coming back in, I mean, that's, that's hard. And you've missed out. And so he's, and, you know, he has all the press and everybody in his, in his ear, like, you should be doing this and you should be here with all these records. Like, so I think... You know, nobody's beyond that. Even at the high level, I think people can still lose some, conf you know, lose some confidence. Federer's done it. I mean, Djokovic, Djokovic early on, you know, had some issues there as well mentally, especially in just focusing. Um, so, is that kind of? Yeah. I mean, I, I just I wanted think, your take on it. Yeah, I just, I think, I mean, I am a huge believer in mental practice. Obviously, I think the games, gosh, at least eighty, maybe ninety percent mental, but. You have to have physical practice in such a technical sport. You have to do that, and I think when you lose that, you're going to lose some confidence. So. What would you say, maybe one single piece of advice to ladies or juniors that can seem to play as well as they practice? Uh, something <coughs> kind of more general, yet from your perspective, not for us as a coach or somebody on the court, that would be able to help them. And having the confidence that they practice with and transfer that to the things from you know, a match like Yeah, so like talking to them about, <clears throat> so these people you have in mind, they just like, they play really well. They like, practice they really don't. well and then seem like everything, they get tight and they just yeah. lock up and can't really produce yeah. the same yeah. uh, tennis they do when they practice. I mean, it would be hard for me to just tell them some advice straight off because I don't know like what's going on, you know, like where that disconnect is between the practice and, and the matches, but I would just say to them, like, you know, maybe just try to be more self-observant in the matches, like, like, what point are, like, if you're getting nervous, like, at what point are you getting nervous, and, like, what seems to be different than practice and then the match, you know, um, and just noticing those little things, and then when they can identify that and, you know, say, well, yeah, like, I don't, throw up an hour before practice because, you know, my coach isn't, sorry, but you know, like, you know, because my, like, you know, it's the shots that I hit out, no big deal, you know, but I am, but when I hit long, like, you know, I, I get really bothered by it, and so I'm nervous about that, um, so that's right there is a very different factor from this practice, so I, I think going back to self-awareness, I know that seems like I've been drove that point home today but really having them notice like what's going on and then you know then saying hey like okay we'll work on it like mm -hmm. at this point mm -hmm. <coughs> well there aren't any more questions thanks for letting me speak to you all and mm -hmm.